For the first time in several decades, researchers have found new moons around Neptune and Uranus, with one of them visible in this image right here. And as you can see, because it's barely visible, this is really why it took so long to discover them and why it took so long to confirm them. But because of this discovery, Uranus now officially has 28 moons and Neptune has 16. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to discuss these new discoveries from Neptune and Uranus, but also compare them to some of the recent discoveries from Saturn and Jupiter, mostly because a lot of these moons do actually have very similar origins and surprisingly have very, very similar properties, which basically implies some kind of a universal mechanism for the formation of irregular moons around various gas giants in the solar system. And so let's discuss the discovery of these three new moons in more detail and talk about what all of this means for our understanding of the solar system as a whole. But first, let's I guess start with a bit of a review from the last few years. I think in the last two or three years, most of the stories we've heard about moons in the solar system were actually always about Jupiter and Saturn. And in some sense, Jupiter and Saturn were almost like having some kind of a race trying to outdo each other in the number of moons. And for a very long time, Jupiter was definitely winning. A total of 95 confirmed moons were discovered in orbit around the planet, with most of them being on the outskirts. These are so-called irregular moons. But it didn't take long, actually it only took a few months, for the researchers to suddenly discover a huge number of moons around Saturn, and after 62 moons were discovered in the system in February of 2023, that number suddenly jumped to 145, which made Saturn the most, I guess, moony planet in the solar system. But the majority of these moons were basically discovered in groups, which is actually one of the reasons why so many moons were discovered all at once. And that's because, for the most part, the moons around Saturn and Jupiter can actually be divided into just a handful of groups. Here are the ones for Saturn, and here are the ones for Jupiter, with all of these groups basically being defined by the types of orbit they have around the planet. For example, here is a very basic diagram showing some of these groups for the irregular moons of Jupiter. And so basically based on the inclination and the overall eccentricity, we can generally divide them into like 5 or 6 groups, suggesting that they most likely all came from much larger individual objects that a long time ago possibly fell apart or maybe collided with something else, forming what's known as the collisional family. Which for the most part seems to be true for pretty much all of these irregular moons we've discovered so far, at least around Jupiter and Saturn. And so in other words, even though there are like hundreds and hundreds of different objects out there, in reality all of them possibly came from just three or maybe four larger moons that for one reason or another fell apart, creating multiple objects. Or at least that's what the scientists always believed about Jupiter and Saturn. But something very similar was always suggested about Neptune and Uranus as well. Because why wouldn't they have the same irregular moons resulting from a larger capture and from some kind of a collisional or tidal disruption? Interestingly, the largest of these groups so far seems to be around Saturn as well. It's known as the Norse group and contains quite a lot of different objects, in terms of numbers most so far, that most likely all came from a much larger moon that was somehow disrupted billions of years ago. And so naturally knowing all of this and knowing how these moons very likely have similar orbits, in the last few years researchers were able to discover more and more by just making assumptions that we're going to have more in very similar orbits in somewhat similar locations. And using this assumption, combined with much better telescopes that we have today, in the last few years all of this resulted in a huge number of new moons discovered around gas giants. But now they've discovered some of the dimmest ones around Neptune and Uranus as well. Barely visible, extremely hard to spot, and in somewhat eccentric orbits. But once again with potentially very similar origins, with both Uranus and Neptune basically capturing potentially a much larger rock billions of years ago that eventually fell apart, forming these smaller irregular moons. And so for Uranus, that's slightly closer to us, the new moon that currently does not have a name is known as S2023U1. This is actually the first Uranian moon discovered in the last 20 years. It's only about 8 kilometers or 5 miles across, which makes it the smallest Uranian moon ever discovered. And it takes roughly around 680 days to orbit around Uranus once. But in this case it's not entirely clear if this is a member of a larger group 
or just an individual object possibly captured by the planet from the Kuiper belt. But then there are two Neptunian moons that were originally spotted back in 2021, but were finally confirmed to exist with their orbits calculated very accurately. The first one, S2002N5, is approximately 23 kilometers across, but has an orbital period of 9 years. So it's pretty far away from the planet. The second moon is a little bit smaller, 14 kilometers across, but actually takes even longer, 27 years to orbit once. This is the moon known as S2021N1. And because of the discovery of these extremely far away moons with very peculiar orbits, it actually confirms that something very similar to Saturn and Jupiter potentially exists around these two planets as well. In other words, it confirms the existence of collisional families, suggesting that these are just three separate members of a much larger family of moons that very likely is still hidden from us because these two planets are just really far away. And by itself, this is a somewhat intriguing discovery because even though Uranus and Neptune are so different from Saturn and Jupiter, they still seem to capture the moons and seem to capture a lot of other objects in an extremely similar way. In other words, it confirms a kind of a universal capture mechanism for all of the giant planets in the solar system when it comes to much smaller objects. Which surprisingly also even applies to Uranus, which technically spins on its side. Even though all of its main moons orbit in a very different plane of orbit, it's still able to acquire irregular moons through the process of capture, very similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But I guess even more intriguingly, Neptune. And with Neptune, the problem is a little bit different. Back in the days, billions of years ago, it captured Triton. And you can sort of see what the problem with Triton is. It's that moon on the outskirts. It orbits against the flow, it orbits in a completely opposite direction. And as a result of this, because it's larger than other moons, it's actually very similar in size to Pluto, it tends to gravitationally disrupt everything in the vicinity and actually tends to cause other moons to eventually lose their orbit and collide with Neptune. Which is why Neptune, unlike other gas giants, only has a very small number of moons in the center. But despite of this, on the outskirts, it seems to have more. It definitely seems to have irregular moons, but in a much, much wider orbit that basically takes a couple of decades to orbit once. But these newly discovered moons of Neptune seem to have some similarities with other moons in terms of orbits. And so, for example, that larger moon of Neptune, known as S2021N1, seems to have a very similar orbit to Samathy, visible right here, and Niso, visible in this image. Two moons that seem to be part of the same family, and now very likely have another member that was just recently discovered. And this, of course, implies either collisional origins or some kind of a tidal disruption billions of years ago. So they probably came from the same body that was much larger in size. Whereas the other moon, S2002 and 5, seems to have a similar orbit to Sao and Laomedia. And so basically, all of these newly discovered moons potentially came from a much larger rock that got disrupted by something billions of years ago. And something similar is observed with the moon around Uranus. Here the orbit is very similar to Caliban and Stefano, with Caliban visible in yellow, Stefano in red, very likely part of the same family as well. And so because of these similarities, and because of the groupings of these much smaller moons, the only explanation here is that all of them came from much larger moons that eventually broke apart for one reason or another. And because Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune all seem to have them, it basically implies some kind of a universal phenomenon that seems to happen everywhere, as long as the planet is massive enough. But it obviously also suggests that there are other smaller moons that we still cannot see. As a matter of fact, anything below one kilometer in size would be completely invisible to us, but chances for those smaller moons to exist out there are actually really high. As a matter of fact, there could be thousands if not millions of them if the idea behind this tidal disruption or collisional destruction is correct. So basically here we're just seeing the larger moon, but we're not seeing smaller pieces that could be orbiting everywhere as well. And so in some sense it might actually even be more accurate to not actually count these as individual moons, but instead count this as a kind of a primordial body, with all these moons just being part of one single group. Which means that for Saturn there are possibly at least three major groups, three different families, Inuit, Gallic and Norse, all very likely coming from much larger bodies, but also a few other irregular moons that possibly have slightly different origins. For Jupiter, there might be more groups, possibly up to seven, which means that there were probably seven different satellites 
that eventually fell apart, forming a lot of different objects. But for Neptune and Uranus, because of their smaller size, they most likely had a lot less of these moons, with basically just one confirmed for Uranus, and maybe four confirmed for Neptune. And so for all of these four planets, if we go back in time a few billion years, we'll most likely just discover a bunch of minor planets, or basically these really large asteroids, that for one reason or another became fragmented and eventually fell apart, forming these collisional families. With the biggest mystery, of course, being what exactly made them fall apart? If it was a collision, what exactly did they collide with? And if it was a tidal disruption, why these moons and not the ones much closer? None of these questions we can answer just yet, but intriguingly, we already know that in the next few months, possibly in a few years, even more moons are going to be discovered around Jupiter and Saturn, because the main researcher behind all of this, Scott Shepard, already mentioned that they're tracking quite a few new moons around Jupiter at this time. And so the number of moons around Jupiter is definitely going to be more than 100 very, very soon. But none of them will have names for quite some time. Actually, quite a lot of these moons still don't have names even years after their original discovery. Although technically, when it comes to Uranus and when it comes to Neptune, they do have a very specific convention. For Uranus, the convention is that they all have to be from Shakespearean plays. And so the new moon has to be one of the Shakespearean characters. Whereas for Neptune, they have to be named after various narrates or sea goddesses from Greek mythology. And because there are so few discovered so far, chances are they might have names very soon. And you might even have a chance to propose those names in the next few years. But at least for now, I think one of the main discoveries coming out of all of this is of course the idea of evolution of moons around the solar system and the intriguing process through which various planets seem to be able to capture larger objects and eventually, for some reason, shred them apart, turning them into much smaller irregular moons. And that's of course the main mystery, at least for now. What's causing this? Why do so many moons fall apart, eventually becoming these very, very small rocks, as opposed to maintaining larger sizes, like for example Triton, that you see orbiting right there in the background? And so why didn't this happen to Triton as well? Is it just a matter of size? Was Triton just a little bit too big? Or is it something else? And so once we have some additional discoveries, or some explanations in regards to what's going on here, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, Check out that other video about Neptune that we will actually discussed very recently that explains the true colors of Neptune and Uranus and how we might have been wrong this whole time. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.